Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Zorisa Lutsevich. I'm the head of Ukraine Forum here and research fellow at uh, Chatham House. Welcome to our session on civil society and how society and culture from Poland and UK is helping Ukraine at the time of uh, dire suffering, a very brutal war of annihilation and with very striking genocidal um, qualities, the destruction that everybody agrees we have not seen on the European continent since the Second World War. Um, and I'm really pleased to uh, chair this session because they're not, this is the session of doers. <laughs> this is the session of people who are here, who are coming to um, an immediate response uh, to the place where it is needed and they are providing solutions. Of course, other sessions are talking about international dimension of NATO enlargement and economics, bigger picture. But you know, down to earth, there are 12 million of Ukrainians that uh, had to leave, flee their home. And when I was in Lublin at one of the help centers, um, talking to a female volunteer who was there, literally repacking donations that were coming from the rest of European cities, she told me, that uh, she had her son who studied in Poland. She lived near Kiev, and her son was always saying, Mom, come join me in Poland. Be nice if we live together. She wasn't sure she wanted to be in Poland. And when Putin attacked Ukraine, she had to flee to Poland to her son. And she looked at me and she said, Putin stole my choice. I wanted to have this choice. So um, yes, of course, there are some people who saw Euro Euro European cities, Warsaw, London as attractive, but m millions had to flee not because of their choice. Uh, and it's, it's very painful. You know, she, that's why Ukrainians are fighting, because to, they want to get back that choice. So I'm joined here by, by uh, an amazing panel of uh, practitioners and, and people who are there on the ground, who's, who are helping uh, every day. Uh, so I'll introduce them in the order they will be um, starting with the introductory remarks. Um, and we'll start with Dr. Wojtek Wilk, who is the chief executive officer of the Polish Center for International Aid. It's one of the three top largest uh, Polish humanitarian NGOs. And uh, Wojtek has an, an impressive experience working a lot uh, at the UN Office for Coordination in Humanitarian Affairs in Iraq, Syria, Yemen. But also he is working with the emergency medical team uh, that is providing response and partnering here also with the UK NHS um, on specific program. And, and is, this is the largest humanitarian Polish NGO uh, being out there working both in Poland and inside Ukraine providing assistance. So welcome, Wojtek. Um, and then uh, we have um, Paula Brennan, who is the director of the humanitarian technical unit at the Save the Children UK. Everybody knows in the UK Save the Children, and she's been more than 18 years working in this humanitarian sector, so she's seen a lot. Uh, and how UK, one of the largest also um, non-profit organizations, is coming to a relief where it's needed. Uh, so we have two quite large organizations, uh, and then we have a grassroots initiative represented by Barbara Vengen, who is the uh, report editor-in-chief at the ED Education for Ukraine, EDU for Ukraine, which is a, a new startup, and she's also a junior fellow at the Visegrad Insight. So quite different scales, but I'm sure we'll go find the middle ground to inform you from different ways. So I'll, I'll go straight to Wojtek to give us his overview and his experience, and then we'll have a conversation all together. Wojtek. Thank you, thank you very much, Alicia. Uh, uh, good afternoon. Uh, the, uh, well, I'm one of the, I'm the head of one of the largest Polish NGOs, but I have been in working in humanitarian affairs since 2001. So um, when I counted the Ukrainian war and the refugee crisis, I think it's my humanitarian crisis number 23. So I have seen a bit, uh, but I have never seen a crisis of such dimensions. We, obviously, we can, we can use the obvious statements that this is the biggest humanitarian crisis in Europe since the Second World War, that the influx of people into the neighboring countries was unprecedented. I mean, millions of people within the first month. But when uh, I am the PCPM, the, the Polish NGO I'm running, is uh, coordinating both with the UN and with the government. And when we were, when we were one of the government coordination meetings um, and kind of having a reasonably loose chat, we, we, we kind of 
having done self-valuation, we were looking at each other and saying, well, in a matter of fact, Polish initial response to the humanitarian crisis has been, by and large, very successful. I mean, we managed to uh, avoid major pitfalls that, that such an influx of such a tremendous number of people brings along. And, uh, and, there are, and this is done, thanks for and foremost, to, due to massive mobilization of, of everybody in the society. I've never seen such a massive mobilization of, of people in Poland. Uh, and uh, this is a bottom-up response with a huge um, involvement of municipalities, local authorities, government playing their role, um, you know, ev all walks of life of people joining in. And obviously there was a sprint. And the sprint now, to everybody's dread, is turning into marathon. Everybody was hoping that this is going to end in a few weeks, in a few months. Now this, this, this hope is, is, is vanishing. And now we have to start looking into the perspective of the upcoming school year, so probably up to the middle of the next year, which is already quite, quite a long, um, quite a long uh, time frame. The, uh, maybe let me take a few, few numbers here, because you, prom you may hear from the resources that Poland has taken in 4.4, 4.5 million people fleeing Ukraine. Well, yes, but. Because those are the numbers of people who have entered Poland through the Polish-Ukrainian borders. And in the same information uh, statement, you'll probably see that there is about two and a half million people who have, during the same time frame, have gone back into Ukraine. So we have a balance of about 1.9 million people on the western side of the Polish-Ukrainian border. And then there is unknown um, percentage of people to us that have migrated on towards Germany, Czech Republic, um, Spain and other European countries, and not only mine, but other migration experts in Poland best estimate is that Poland hosts about 1.4, 1.5 million refugees at this point in time, which is still a very significant number. Uh, that is to some extent corroborated by the fact that the Polish social security system has issued 1.21 million uh, registration numbers, what we call PESEL, for the Ukrainian refugees. There is also a small num uh, percentage of people who probably have not, uh, didn't want to, re to, 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 to register because of, among others, a fear that if they register in Poland, they wouldn't be able to register in another European country. But that, that 1.21 million have actively sought um, access to the Polish social services. Uh, there is, among that, uh, that, that at least 1.2, 1.5 million people, 45% are children. The other 45% are women. Um, then we have about 6 to 8%, uh, at least 6% elderly above, uh, above the age of 60, 65, with only a slitter, about 4% being men, because men are not, in military age, are not allowed to leave from Ukraine. Well, if you talk to Save the Children, if you talk to any uh, humanitarian organization, and you ask them what is the, who is eligible for humanitarian aid, people will tell you women and children. Well, in Poland, that's pretty much everybody, right? Mm -hmm. But it's one and a half million people in a developed country, which would make the, the assistance budgets extremely, extremely high. So there is a challenge how to focus the assistance on those people who are really in, 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 in the biggest need of assistance. What is, what is very positive, what is for me remarkable in this response, is that there has been a, an enormous um, response from the private sector in terms of donations, but also from the private, private sector in terms of employment. Poland is in that, in that current time blessed with very low unemployment, lowest since 1990, and uh, about 45% of adult refugees in Poland, predominantly women, have been already gainfully employed. I mean, this is, this is a factor which is unprecedented, at least in my knowledge of humanitarian crisis, because that 45% of refugees can sustain themselves on their own, and then the children are covered with 500 zloty child benefit. Then, um, so the challenge for us as humanitarian organizations is to how to reach out and how to focus the assistance on people who will need the assistance most and probably because those are the people who are not able to work. And those are elderly, so about 6 to 8 percent of the, of the refugee case told. Persons with disabilities, not that many of them, but for the time being, they don't have any access to the Polish social security system. And then women with small children. For us, there is a challenge how to 
how to, do, how to define women with small children. Is a child up to the age of three, which is about the child up to the age of, the age of seven? Well, but if we go for an age up to the age of seven, then the number of eligible people would be quite high. And again, the costs of, of monthly uh, humanitarian assistance goes into hundreds of dollars per person, unlike somewhere else in Africa so, or, or in or other developing countries. So, so the, 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 the budgets that are potentially we are talking about in case of Poland are very, very significant. Um, 204,000 Ukrainian children are, have been enrolled in the Polish school in the last year. And now uh, August is going to be pretty much decision time because the Ukrainian refugee families will have to decide, do they want to enroll their child in Ukrainian schools in Ukraine, and then the, the child will stay there throughout the, the school year, or they will stay in Poland, and we don't know which way it's going to go. I mean, we, one of the scenarios sees that the Polish schools will take in up to 300,000 Ukrainian children, which is about 7.5% of all school-going children, which would be already a challenge. Uh, as I'm already talking too much, uh, two, two things. Uh, we, we need to look how to preempt any, not tensions, but disagreements between the two communities creeping up. So really su uh, uh, support the social services, education first and foremost, healthcare and other services. And secondly, Game of Thrones, winter is coming. And the, um, the, the, the winter is going to be vicious because of very high heating costs. So if the Ukrainian refugees are supposed to be assisted, this, the same, at least 20% of that assistance should be also going to the, to the Polish vulnerable families, so-called balancing component of the humanitarian aid. But that one is, uh, well, this is one of the things that we'll have to work. There are many other things, yeah. but let me I stop it's, here. It's, uh, it's important that you point to that massive mobilization of different sectors, that it's not just government taking a, a burden, but also burden sharing between private sector and, and civil society. And, you know, on, on the other side, in Ukraine, we see a similar uh, trend where, you know, m let's, let's be honest, most people pref still stay in Ukraine, so it's not like most people cross the border, and you have the same level of 80% of Ukrainians involved in some kind of charitable activities, voluntary activities, helping. So, uh, so and, and it's, it's quite encouraging to hear this kind of level of integration, to which I am sure is quite different in the UK because of uh, language barrier, because of different cost of living, and in general. So, so Paula, I, I'd like to go to you to, and, and of course the scale, right? I mean, how many Ukrainians actually have arrived? We looked with a colleague before, and it's, it's roughly 62,000 that actually used the family or the sponsorship scheme. Um, so how do you see it from your experience in also seeing it so for many years and uh, how do you assess that response? Yeah, I'll talk a little bit about, about the UK, but m most of my experience of this response is from my time. I was uh, a few months in, in Poland, but in the UK, um, figures I have are 82,000, uh, so 62 yeah. that are in the, the housing scheme um, and then others beside. And the, the outpouring from civil society and the, and the British public was huge. Um, the DEC appeal um, has uh, raised an absolute fortune. I think it's 350 million GBP. And in fact, it got into the Guinness Book of Records for the highest money raised by an appeal in a week. So, I mean, the British public went wild for Ukraine. And we saw that in all places, in churches, in youth groups, in, in schools, everybody fundraising for Ukraine, uh, um, sending care packages, jumping in ambulances and, and whatnot. Um, Save the Children linked up with other big organisations in the UK, um, working on um, advocacy um, around some safeguarding issues. Our government's approach to housing refugees wasn't um, the most secure system that they could have come up with, so we did a lot of work around that, and also a lot of work around we're at risk of creating a, a two-tier system of refugees. Uh, so in the UK, some refugees are housed with families, and some of them are put on planes to Rwanda, so there's a lot of behind-the-scenes advocacy work um, that's going on there. Um, and then there's a lot of work as well supporting uh, where Save the Children, so our focus is on, on small children, around working with local authorities who are going to be working with children who have experienced the horrors of war. So uh, kind of training and other kinds of support and also for uh, uh, hosting families around the UK. So quite a lot of activity going on there. I went to um, Poland on, I think it was the 7th of March. So 
um, quite early uh, after the the conflict started and I went down to the border and I, I visited several of the border sites. I was absolutely blown away. I mean, everything that you said in terms of the, that grassroots response, I heard a figure and I can't remember my source now, but like 300,000 refugees mobilized. The, the Scouts Association were everywhere, the fire service, university students, um, businesses giving up um, properties to use as reception centers on the border um, and then a little bit away from the border. Uh, transport hubs, um, uh, translators, people handing out SIM cards and setting up new cards. I mean, it was absolutely phenomenal. Wheelchairs and pushchairs lined up at the, at the border point. Never seen anything like it, ever. It was deeply impressive. Um, I think for someone like, say, the children, so we, we have been in Ukraine since 2014 and we've been in Romania, there's a Save the Children Romania, also Lithuania, but not in Poland. So we went out to set up our operations and see how we could support. Uh, so that took us a bit of a time to, to register. And I think the challenge when there is such strong civil society, large NGOs and INGOs in Poland already working out where do we fit, um, what's the solidarity and what's the actual technical expertise that we can bring and, and how do we bring that. So most of my work when I was there, um, was, um, apart from trying to work out what was going on and where were all these people once they moved out of the reception centres, uh, was, was looking for local and national organisations that needed either financial support or other kind of support so that they could either scale up what they were doing already or um, maybe add particular services or expertise that they hadn't had prior to the conflict because that wasn't the kind of work that they did. I think the unpredictability makes it really, really difficult to plan. You know, we talk about contingency planning. We've been talking about the next wave since March. Is, is there a next wave or is winter the next problem? But actually, I think we've got an awful lot to sort out now, um, even without thinking about the next wave, because we still have a lot of children out of school. We still have a lot of people who are not able to access what they need to access. Uh, there were groups of people who weren't treated the same way as Ukrainians, so third country nationals, LBGTQ, uh, Roma populations. Uh, so working out where are those people and how can they be supported and what are the grassroots organisations that are working for those particular communities. Um, I've been thinking about lessons. I think it's probably too early to talk about lessons, and I think we're quite famous in our sector for uh, saying we're learning lessons and then repeating the same mistake. But I think one thing that really jumps out is the way the EU came together with such speed and determination um, to ensure that people had a really swift and safe uh, procedure to move through to different European countries. And I think that just shows that... Um, establishing those safe routes for people to transit um, is, is massively important. And if you compare that to 2015, where there was absolute chaos and um, uh, really significant ch child safeguarding and protection uh, risks caused by um, some of the political turmoil around the, the movement. Um, I think I'll stop there, because that felt like more than five minutes, and then hopefully the other points yeah, well, can come in sure uh, in, the, in the questions. The discussion. But it's, um, we, we have clear kind of thread in what Wojtek said and you, Paul, about reintegration uh, of those who want to build new lives, sustaining those who are still willing to come back, and, and I'm sure most people um, from what I know, it's not based on statistics, but anecdotal, you know, evidence, want to come back partially because Ukrainian men cannot leave. Um, women actually prefer to stay closer to Ukrainian border in Poland, Moldova, Romania, so that in case, God forbid, something happens, they can quickly uh, go back to Ukraine. But, you know, I mean, as we know, it's mostly women and children, and for women, what matters is that their children are studying, that they are... They are that they continue life as normal as possible. So uh, that's why, Barbara, well, your initiative comes, you know, really needed. And I was thinking, thanks God for COVID. I'm sorry, I, I, I should not say that. But this online education that happened throughout COVID really helped for such a normal 
adaptation to online learning. And I know Ukrainian uh, students, uh, my godson here, he still studies Ukrainian program living in Highgate in London. So uh, very, you know, impressive. So can you tell us especially how technology can be used and what are the solutions? Uh, how do you okay. see it? So from um, replying to some of the things that came up earlier, um, it's very interesting how uh, COVID changed our perception of education mm -hmm. and how it can function. Um, and how it be controlled, how it can be maximized and optimized in order to um, have the biggest amount of people within the education system. Because let's be honest, education system, especially when we're talking about kids, it's not only about education. It is about having everyday routine. It is about having a group which even through Zoom or any other um, different platform, you can see you have a certain community which is incredibly important. And that's why in Poland now, it is just a crucial question and has been since um, February, how should we approach the system of education? Even the ministry asked the um, transatlantic forum leaders, of which one of the representatives is also here, um, and they've written an amazing report on how should we approach the question, how well we don't have the answers. And because the decision has to be made, what kind of education do we want? If we want to make additional um, classes in which only solely Ukrainian students will be learning Polish and then will be joined to, um, uh, to uh, communal classes or whether we'll be having communal classes since the beginning, we still don't know. And that's a thing that uh, we, especially group from my age, so 20 couple of year olds who either as many of my peers completely have thrown out um, studies out of their heads and just went to the border, or some of the peers like me myself had not the possibility to do so. Um, and that was kind of reaction of uh, students, and that's why we also engaged ourselves into EdTech community, of which I'll be talking soon, in a minute, um, because um, especially coming back to the topic of our panel. It's about civil society. Civil society is one, it's like democracy, how to define it, nobody knows. But still, we use it, we use the term every day. Um, and the thing about civil society's reaction is that it was amazing. And I think we all agree that even in Poland, just we all as Poles like could not believe it. Again, from international uh, reaction, it was just astounding the scale, the kind of uh, maximization over such a long period of time. Still, there are people of the border. Let's not talk about it in present tense. The reaction is still amazing, uh, but still we don't have, and I think that what Paul was talking about, this kind of safety in a thinking in future as well about whether this help is sure, whether it's just temporary or permanent. And I think that these kind of initiatives, especially grassroots, try to approach it in this way, try to kind of stabilize the situation, not only for um, the refugees, but also for ourselves being kind of a younger generation which is interested in politics and is kind of tired of just complaining about it. Um, but when we come to educational technology, I think um, within every now humanitarian organization, this is a big topic. It's mostly focused about setting certain schools which will be online, as Ukraine has done, which I highly invite you to checking the program because it's just impeccable the way they have they, the way they have created it and how even Ukrainian university right now works. Um, but the problem is that so many people now are in the double system. So for example, some people are both in British and Ukrainian system. Some people are both in Polish and Ukrainian system. This is not healthy because education, again, is not only about getting Polish classes. This is about mental health. This is about having the language, meaning having the access to integration of any kind. This is literally the tool of acceptance that we can have, thinking of the long term, not only thinking about what can we do to actually alleviate the problem currently in this minute, in this second. And um, definitely um, that was something that we came up to, me being the editor-in-chief, as we can see, um, writing the report, uh, which was written uh, by both people, even born in 2005, imagine they're still born, um, and people much older having uh, 
uh, much more experienced in the educational system. And we've come to much conclusions that despite the fact that we have such an amazing reaction, we have so many grassroots initiatives which I myself represent, there is still an amazing conundrum, amazing problem that I think nobody really can tackle about how to organize it all, how to improve the communication, how to improve. This is definitely something Wojciech, we will not be able to kind of communicate on because this is something you do for a living, right? And I'm thinking mostly about all these volunteers who are many of them on the brink of a burnout yeah. because they can't be spending so much time on the border, even emotionally. They can't be spending their every minute, especially now that most of the funding is from the international NGOs. It's not only uh, the public funds, it's mostly the private sector, which is very often from abroad. And that's something we also try. That's why Edu for Ukraine is a part of Foundation Native Aid, which has also um, started language sub initiative. And then again, this is about taking kids into your educational care, I would say, taking new teachers who very often now, given the reforms, are leaving the Polish educational system but still want to teach. Uh, but still, having this kind of scale of a problem, having these kind of amounts of people with whom we all want to be in contact with, it's just a grand scale. And that's something we all have to think. And that's why, especially when, we've, when we were talking before the panel, this is something which I will emphasize on. It's an incredibly important lesson, I'll say, um, how we have to think about crisis response, how we have to think about certain neutral mechanism, which we can have both from grand international NGOs, which do amazing work across the borders, and for people like me and representatives from Edith for Ukraine, who did not know at all how to engage, despite the fact that we are also the civil society that wants to be engaged, that is engaged at this scale, but nobody knows what they're doing. Because who is, except from you two, equipped in that kind of knowledge? Very few people. Um, and yet that kind of future long-term thinking is definitely something we both need in both private and public sector. Well, I think you're pointing to the, the, the key word, which is ambiguity and uncertainty. And there is that uncertainty you know, inside Ukraine with how the war will uh, evolve. And, uh, you know, to be honest, the whole of Ukraine is under attack despite the fact that most military operation is concentrated in the east. But also ambiguity among those families who are... Uh, who fled, uh, whether they will come back or not, like you say, in September. Um, but I think, you know, the being able to cope with this uncertainty is something, you know, that it's very difficult for a man, healthy mental outlook. Imagine if you live through trauma. So I think uh, also for, for people working in the voluntary sector in civil society, we have to understand that we are entering a new phase and we have to do some serious thinking. And perhaps today at the end of the session, you, ha you will be able to share some of those ideas, what matters for the next stage, right? Because we all agree there's one period is over, so we are entering a new, um, a new challenge. So maybe I'll bring in the audience and then we'll, um, we'll, uh, we'll come back to that um, question towards the end. So who would like to, uh, if you could please introduce yourself, say uh, your name, organization, where you're from, and then, yes, go ahead, and then we'll, over there, and then. Hello. Okay. You, you, yeah, make, That's make. much more advanced than I expected. <laughs> uh, hello, my name is Adelaide. Yeah, I'm representing Transatlantic Future Leaders Forum, and thank you so much for your contributions. And uh, yeah, I just echo what Vasha said. Like, I mean, uh, because we uh, did a report uh, on how to integrate Ukrainian kids in the Polish educational system, and that started the work on it started right after uh, the war broke, and we we released the report in mid March, and it has been already taken into account by the minister, and it's been being implement some some schools are implementing from their own initiative and our recommendations have been also taken into account by uh, by the ministry because we um, it was very important what Basha said that like we need to kind of converge this public and private and like these grassroots organizations are crucial but I think we also need to remember like about the public so sometimes it's very highly bureaucratized and how do we try and make this more effective so that's why we we came up with this report and um so i just wanted to maybe i don't really have a question but i just wanted to kind of like a point to think about um yeah how we can available in English yes so you can uh, if you find transatlantic 
Transatlantic Future Leaders Forum slash report and you Google it and you can find it and uh, maybe you will find it useful for, for some of your initiatives, but okay. yeah. Yeah, thank you. Maybe we can share it in the, in the please. So my question, so my name's Izzy, I work at Wonder Foundation. It's a, it's a smaller, more, it's a women and girls education charity in, based in South London, and we do migrant integration projects. So, uh, and we worked with uh, a bunch of Ukrainian refugees in Poland after the Crimea crisis. So it's obvious when this all kicked off to, to do another project. And I'm curious, you've all sort of touched on it. The most mad amount of money has been raised. There's lots of, been the most extraordinary response, I think, from so many different sides. How are the links made? You know, how, how do we spend that money well? Uh, and how do you, because there seems to be, you know, and it's an obvious and natural thing, a mismatch between all the need we're hearing and the money that's there, and how do we, how do we link the two together, is my question. Well, maybe, maybe Wojtek, you can take this one. Oh. You've been doing a lot of coordination of UN uh, funding and assistance. So um, how, how would you go about it? You know, the humanitarian assistance, um, by default, you cannot plan it. And you cannot, it, this is not about the long-term uh, planning. Uh, the, um, all the humanitarian strategies, uh, so-called annual appeals or consolidated, consolidated appeals, they have maximum time frame of one year. So what UNHCR did in April uh, of this year, they have planned for and have budgeted for operations up to December, which was already by the time a pretty long time frame. And probably by, uh, by December we are, or November, December, we will enter uh, various, you say, PCPM, various other organizations, UN agencies, the Polish government will enter into a planning process how to plan the priorities and what are the budgetary needs for humanitarian assistance in Poland and other countries, including Ukraine, mm -hmm. in the entire of 2023, based on certain scenarios, certain assumptions. And, well, it's too early to say what are going to be the assumptions, but, but, but that's, that's how it is. It's, we're not talking about the long-term planning. I think that now, for me, my time frame is up to the end of the, ne of the next school year, which is up to the middle of 2023, and it's already long, and I'm dreading that, that time frame, because you mentioned about the funding. The, you know, there, were, there, are two, uh, there are two conflicting priorities. One is that uh, there is a need, at least in the initial months, to, to reach out to as many people with as much assistance as possible to, to kind of excuse the um, you know, non-official language, to burn the cash, right? To, to, to just, just, just go out and, and just go out with the assistance without hurting the cash for the, for the, for the, for the next months. I mean, because people are in need, people need this assistance to settle in Poland, and this is why such, uh, such programs were, were done. For instance, right now, come the second half of the year, I'm personally concerned how what is going to be the funding situation that we might start seeing um, you know, certain funding shortfalls. Because, for instance, in case of PCPM, uh, one of our, our flagship program is that we employ 1,000 Ukrainian refugee teachers who are delegated by, who are seconded by us to Polish schools mm -hmm. to act as assistant teachers to help with children's integration, psychosocial support, negotiation between uh, Ukrainian and, uh, parents and the school and the Polish parents and so on and so on hugely successful program, so helping the children, helping the local authorities and everybody and who else. Who is financing this work? Uh, it is financed only by American NGOs. And, the, and I'm saying this because right now for 1,000 uh, teachers for the entire school year, mm -hmm. the, 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 the price tag is $14 million, which already, can't, this is in terms of the humanitarian aid, this is huge money. <laughs> Right? Yeah. So, so and, and, you know, for instance, those teachers are, you know, you cannot just enter, you know, have a teacher for two months, right? When those kids are going to be in the school for the, for the, for the, for the, for the whole year. Then the, for instance, any, any cash assistance programs, the, 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 price, the, the cost per person is between six and seven hundred zlotys per person per month which is, I don't know how to translate it into pounds, slightly over 100 pounds per, per person per month. Again, yes, but if you multiply it by thousands or tens of thousands of families times three or six months, then again, the amount of, the amount of funding is quite considerable. Uh, what I, the one of the points I wanted to make is that 
we are still we are seeing seeing the ups and downs of the of the refugee flows. And because at least PCPM we are we are running a, a transit site for the for the Ukrainian refugees next to Warsaw East railway station since March. And we see it, we see people arriving, we see people departing. It's very likely we'll have to open a second hub, a medical hub in Zeshov, which is going to be another big project we'll have to burn, uh, shoulder. But, the, uh, but my appeal to all of the government representatives is to really consider for DFID, for USAID, for ECHO, for various uh, foreign donors to really consider funding uh, INGOs, such as Save the Children, or the Polish NGOs, because there is too much money lumped with the UN. Mm -hmm. the, the UN is deploying multiple people on short missions from Latin America, Africa, people not really accustomed to that, to that, to that, to that, to that uh, scenario. And I, I don't rate their response as effective, I'm afraid. Mm -hmm. Would you like to add anything, Paula? Yeah. Um, how to I match? Think, yeah, I'd like to um, add. I think um, solidarity, international solidarity, comes with a huge amount of red tape. And that, I think, is one of the problems. So we talk a good talk about the grand bargain and locally led responses and getting the money where it uh, needs to be. Um, but you know, even speaking from, from my experience in Save the Children, it takes a while to set up partnerships and funding streams mm -hmm. to people. Um, many of the, the um, uh, organizations that we were talking to we're speaking to another 10 INGOs, so they're getting inundated with money, I'm not talking about the big players like these guys, but some of the other organizations. Um, and it's really tricky, and we need to get better um, at, at a no regrets, getting the money where it needs to go much more quickly, lighten up on the due diligence a little bit, um, and, and trust that the money is going to get there. So I think that's important. I think that donors, um, yes, giving money to us instead of the UN, but also committing to multi-year funding so that planning can be done, but not committing too tightly, because that's the other thing. You know, Within week two, you have to do a very detailed plan of what it is that you're going to do. And the following week, that doesn't make sense anymore. So we need that flexibility um, to be able to um, you know, work with, with organizations that are there and have the expertise already. Um, and, and be flexible with how that money is used. And, and while we're on funding, before I bring in more from the audience, I mean, there was information that EU is, is um, earmarking a 13 billion assistance to host countries of Ukrainian refugees. What is happening with that? Do you have any updates on that, Wojtek? You know, there's this, there this animated GIF of John Travolta from Pulp Fiction who's doing, <laughs> who's doing like this, right? I mean, uh, I don't see that money. Uh, I, uh, I, I wish we can see it because uh, I'm, I'm concerned really about the second half of the year and upcoming winter. Yeah. But for the time being, um, there is not much. Okay, well, that's something. Also, to, if I could also yeah. reply, because I think what Paul was talking about is very important. Um, very few initiatives like Edifier Ukraine are stable. Mm -hmm. this, is, like, this is just a fact. These are, again, grassroots initiatives, which it's amazing that they happen, but they very often led by high schoolers, uh, by students, uh, by graduate students, people who cannot commit full time to the job, cannot commit to do 120% of expertise. They just cannot. And that's why there's this problem with the money, because um, despite the fact that the I, my organization, any organization like mine, can have the best um, idea, can have the best um, even plan for it. There is no answer whether, for example, the problem will change into months and then I have to completely reschedule everything that I had in my life. This is something that one has to do 100%. And that's the problem with grassroots initiatives and that's why they so often don't have the money, they don't get it because they're not trustworthy. And I think I can fully claim that being a representative mm -hmm. of that kind of organization. And that's just a fact because these are just people who commit their every minute of free time to something like that, but they cannot commit their full lives. And that's again why this kind of sort of bigger organization 
possibly from above, is needed to make a network of it. They are grassroots networks, again, very often led by organizations like international NGOs uh, or even small organizations or like PCA, PCIA, which is amazing. But at the same time, discussion is sometimes not enough. The audits, the uh, taxes, everything around that, it just takes time. That's true. But also, I think the way to um, spin off, if you want, well, what you want to see if something is really working in, uh, in the model that you've designed, let's say an educational product or a service, either it should be bought by the state, you know, in a way, uh, either subcontracted to you and uh, did you have sustainable funding or taking over from you and implemented by, by the state. Or, you know, in some cases, and here I'm not sure it's quite relevant, it goes on the market. There is no other way in a way to uh, maintain sustainability. Very difficult. So let's bring more because I've seen, yes, lots of hands. Great. Here and then gentlemen. Yes, go ahead. And then, then. Well, that's, Please, um, by the microphone. Just look here. Quite spooky. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Pavel Zorovets at the University of Sheffield Journalism Studies. Um, my question is to all of the panelists, because I believe uh, and I sense that you're all facing very, very similar problems. Um, as the media coverage of the conflict in Ukraine is gradually decreasing in Western press and Western broadcast media, um, the mobilization of resources, public support, um, and maintaining the momentum of all those activities that you're talking about going ahead, going forward, is going to be increasingly challenging. I was just wondering, uh, can you possibly guys comment on strategic communication activities that you deploy in order to maintain this momentum uh, and the awareness of the issues that you're dealing with on a daily basis, vis-a-vis uh, -vis the pitfalls that you probably all kind of experienced um, uh, in your daily practice? What do you think can be done better, if you, if you like? Great question. Hi, everyone. I'm Colin McGivern. I'm from the British Council. And my question builds on the question from Pavel. And it's about how do you, um, how can we all work together to prevent the tensions being exploited between the communities, uh, Ukrainian and Poland? Very good question. So let's first do on strategic communication. How do we keep attention and how do we keep uh, resources flowing? and human resources as well. So maybe we'll start with Barbara and go this way. Um, for us, it's quite easy because literally everyone is scared of September. That's when, this, that's when the school year starts. And this whole summer is just focused on how to survive September and then October and then but do you feel November. Are also scared, or it's just you scared? No, you know? no, 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 no. Okay. It's it's the whole community. Okay. It's uh, for example, we are talking quite often with uh, with a lot of uh, also ethnic uh, startups from Estonia, mm -hmm. and um, they're all very much engaged in the public scene and with their all um, initiatives from both apps to also programs, and they all think about the same thing: how these upcoming two months, so July and August, is the time of focusing on contacts with local authorities mm -hmm. um, and that's kind of problematic. Uh, and how to alleviate the massive problem that will be in September, not only talking about how we don't have enough teachers at schools, how we don't have enough money for teachers, but also how we don't have enough hours or even enough rooms. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think maybe I'll come from a slightly different angle. From our perspective, money is not the issue right now. Um, uh, I think our Ukraine um, country team, their, their strategic ambition, they, they have that money. It's spending it in a very effective um, way that we need to focus. And actually, we're trying to make sure that the news is kept on places like um, uh, Afghanistan, Yemen, Horn of Africa, impending uh, food crisis in, in a number of countries. So, of course, we're still um, uh, supporting the Ukraine crisis with, with communications and talking to donors, um, but we're also really trying to balance that with making sure the world doesn't forget all the other crises that are, um, that are brewing. Um, in, in terms of, um, you mentioned human resources, and that's one of the challenges that we have rather annoyingly, like the UN, uh, we have a massive turnover of staff that we send in, particularly in the first, um, 
the first phases. And one of our problems is being able to get Schengen visas in time for people, not only the um, the people that are in Poland, but the ones that need a Polish uh, visa in order to get into Ukraine and get out again if security requires. And that is a massive problem. So we're, we're struggling to get the right um, expertise um, either in Poland or um, bringing in kind of without nicking staff from other effective organizations. Are there other locations that you have deployed people in other regions, you mean, within, say, the children? No. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Wojtek? No, the volunteer response, which has been the main driving force of the response in Poland, is, is it has to be time-bound because people need to go back to their day-to-day -day jobs. They need to start earning a living. And either they are provided with funding to do what they are doing as their, as their volunteer work and then, you know, get paid from this, mm. or they will have to, they will have to uh, stop it. So, you know, for instance, our policy is to employ as many volunteers, get them proper contracts, and, and help, them, help them do it, help them help, uh, allow them to assist the local authorities and, 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 and uh, you know, provide this kind of emergency employment to mm -hmm. keep the volunteering spirit and, and, and the process forward. On the media coverage, um, in the humanitarian world, we have the term of CNN effect. Uh, which is, you know, the, 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 the lenses of a camera on a certain crisis. Everybody's talking about it. Everybody's contributing money to this. And then the, 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 the lens is moving away. Well, look at today's developments in London, right? The, uh, the, the lens is moving away. And then the whole funding drops like a stone and everybody's forgetting about the crisis. And uh, well, on one thing, on one side, it's natural. People get bored. Of, of the same messages, and that's that's the sorry reality. The challenge for the humanitarian players is how to keep the, 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 the journalists continue to talk about it. So when we were discussing, where we were internally discussing our our advocacy policy, is one thing is to, despite all the all the all the tragedies and gloom um, coming from Ukraine, trying to show some positive yeah. aspects of the crisis. Uh, for instance, uh, thanks to CARE, we are co-funding uh, this daycare campaigns in the Polish city, in 20 Polish cities, the summer in the city, that allows participation of the Ukrainian refugee children. So in Lublin, for instance, uh, there are 15, uh, every weekend of the summer, there is an integration picnic between the Polish neighbors and the Ukrainian refugees. And with the, with the theaters, with the, you know, lots of, lots of fun stuff. I need to go to one, so I'll be able to report you to more. <laughs> but uh, it, looks, it looks extremely encouraging. And, you know, those positive things that, you know, in despite of all the, the tragedies, you know, children can go to school, they have friends, and so on. The second one is really we need to, um, all the humanitarian players, we need to ramp up our advocacy around winter. Because this is where the funding is going to be low, and well, the funding needs going to be at the highest, and uh, and also, you know, the whole challenge of of also because the, the media is not only about reaching to the international uh, to the international audience, but also how to reach the refugees, yeah. uh, because the Ukrainian refugees they don't use Facebook, they use Telegram. They don't read the Polish press, they, you, they read some other press. So for instance, with UNICEF, we are launching a, a back to school hotline in Poland mm -hmm. as of the 1st of August. Uh, don't hold me on that date, but <laughs> as of early August. And our plan is to plaster Poland with billboards mm -hmm. in Ukrainian saying, well, if you want to, if you need assistance to register your child for the school, call this number. So mm -hmm. actually we are now, right now establishing the, which, which number to put on the, on the billboards. But, the, uh, but you know, there are different ways of, of getting to different people. In terms of tensions, I think the tensions, I don't, I don't, I'm not worried too much about the tensions. This is not like other crises because the Polish understand what the Ukrainians are going through. But I think this should be our common objective to, to address proactively the areas where the tensions can creep up. And one is the, the healthcare system. And here, in the, I don't know what we can, that, what we can do, but uh, for instance, um, the, the number of patients in the Polish clinics has increased by about 8% because of the, of the influx of the refugees. Education, this is, I think this is where the humanitarian agencies can do a lot, among others through employment of additional staff. Um, but also look at the rental market, which is a pretty normal thing in all the humanitarian crisis. I mean, 
the, the rental prices in Warsaw has, have nearly doubled. So people who are, who are not house owners, they, they, they're going to suffer. And, but luckily, we don't, we are not, we're probably not going to see much of a comp competition in the labor market, which at least takes away one of the usual aspects. In Poland. In Poland. Oh, want, one of the usual aspects of the, country, of, of, the, of, the of, of, of misunderstandings between the refugees and the, and the, and the host community. And, and this is also what Poland shares with the UK, because there's also plenty of vacancies here, you know, at the level of uh, shop, assistance, you know, you, but you need to know the language. That's another thing. Mm -hmm. Why so many people stay in Ukraine? Because just uh, in Poland, sorry, because it's easier with the language, easier to learn. I don't want to put my colleague Anna Morgan on the spot, but uh, she's over there. She's, she's been doing uh, as a voluntary action in addition to working here. An amazing work. And you know what I think? It's, it's engaging other Ukrainians who are in Poland, are in UK, to help Ukraine. Can you just say a few words? Just say a few words. Just wanted to say that this amazing experience of hiring Ukrainian teachers yeah to second Polish teachers mm -hmm. is a fantastic idea that I think should be implemented here. Because what I hear from UK schools that they're struggling because not often or very rarely they have teachers who can understand the kids that are enrolled. And that for come September, it's gonna be even a bigger problem because even more Ukrainians are coming. As you know, the numbers of uh, visas received, it's a longer process to come here than to, than to Poland. More kids are gonna to come to UK schools and they won't have teachers to understand them. So I, I, I beg you to, to share this experience with, yes. uh, um, um, with, with the system here. Yeah, and also I think what, what we've seen, and this is where civil society comes as a sector that is more, is fast, it uh, sees the needs and it f finds a solution, you know, like doing a brochure life in the UK in Ukrainian, for example. Mm -hmm. It wasn't the government who did it, right? It was a, a group of volunteers who did it. And, and I think now we have to speak of uh, what has been done and to prepare for the, exactly for the next challenge and um, get the right funding, the right people in place to carry on because we are here in the long haul. Uh, all of us agree and uh, we're all tired, so it's, it's not easy. Um, there was a hand here and then we'll, and over there, yeah. Um, hi, I'm Marta from British Pulse. Uh, you mentioned funding a lot of times and I read that uh, the European Commission pledged 144 uh, million euros to Poland. Obviously that money is kind of in limbo, but I was wondering, has the European Union provided any alternative supports to Poland uh, in, the humanitar in the humanitarian uh, aid to the refugees? Have they done enough? What else could, it, could they have done? Yeah. Just okay, this question. You funding the, the lady, yeah. and some hand of the... yes. Hi, my name is Magda Harvey. I represent the White Eagle Club. I initiated one of the first appeals in UK to uh, raise donations for humanitarian aid for Ukraine, and uh, I can say that success has killed my action because people. <laughs> we. My intention was to. Uh, collect humanitarian aid, send it to Poland or to Ukraine to support Ukrainians. Uh, but because we got so much so many donations and so much attention from media, we got bombarded with the questions from every aspect of life, from Ukrainians, from host families, from institutions in Ukraine, in Poland. Everybody is talking to us as if we were gods, even above the governments, and if we had some kind of power. Uh, but as a result of it, we started to do meetings for Ukrainian refugees in the Polish club. Mm -hmm. And that question is for, for Paula. We get a lot of women with kids and the problem is that a lot of those kids still haven't been admitted to schools because they are either no places or it is too late in the year. And kids don't speak English. Mm -hmm. they, the ages vary from four to 16. Mm -hmm. They are bored, they are frustrated. They don't have online lessons. They don't have PCs. They don't have, mm -hmm. la, they don't have uh, iPads. They don't have access to online education. There are no classes for them here. Nobody, there are a lot of classes for adults. There are no classes for children to teach them English. 
they are isolated. Mm. A lot of them are traumatized. We've got the classes for adults from six to seven. And at the same time, we've got the volunteers who are running activities for children. And half of them are stuck to their mothers and they don't want to leave. And even though they can see that there is fun, there, there is dancing, there are art classes, they want to be with their mothers doing English classes. So the whole class, English class, is disturbed by two or three kids who are sitting there being bored. But anyway, just to cut the story short, my question is, and I keep talking to, to my local council, and the answer is sent us an email, and host families and refugees are sending the emails, there are no replies, or ask us the question, they've sent us the lady from Citizen Advice Bureau, ask her the question, we ask her the question, she doesn't have the answers to 90% of the questions, and I can see frustration, I can see the huge mental issues among mm -hmm. adults and kids, who in UK can help me to help them mm. because I get more and more frustrated people who not only lost everything what they had in Ukraine and they are not sure if they can go back there, they lost their dignity and they were given the hope to come here and everybody is telling them around that they are safe, so what is their problem? <laughs> their problem is yes. that apart from being safe, they are just hanging in Answers. They just don't know what to do. Is there any organization that we can send them to, any organization that we can work with? Because this is really, and we get tens and tens and tens of emails and messages, people begging for help. Where is that help, help in UK? Mm. Yes. Okay. Um, I can't give you a specific organization that I can direct you to, but afterwards I can take your name and get our UK programs team to talk to you at the risk of sounding like I'm passing you on like you've been passed on before. But <laughs> let's, talk, like let, let's talk afterwards, because I don't know the answer to your question is the, yeah. is the truth. But, but there is also a network of UK-based charities that are helping Ukrainians and a meeting online uh, that uh, we're supposed to have Dr. Ole Ono here from the Manchester University. And we can also connect you through that network, perhaps, you know, you know, it's a question of either getting dedicated funding to hire assistance to, you know, provide mental health or support for, for the families. That is a big area where we all need more, much more uh, assistance uh, because it's not just, I mean, there's big trauma, big trauma. We all, we all know it. And um, some of these people resettled twice. Let's oh. not forget that the war started in Ukraine in 2014. They've built their life, let's say, in Mariupol. Now Mariupol is raised to ground. Now they're running away. So um, yes, uh, let's let's see where we can connect, and then maybe there should be some kind of a, a joint campaign here in the UK to think about uh, future steps after six months, because the host families are hosting here for six months. Again, yeah. the question comes: What happens? The cost of living, the housing, you name it. Right? There's a lot of. Let me maybe take the issue of the European yes, funding please. because the lighter one. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, the, from what I understand is that the main predicament is that the EU humanitarian arm, which is ECHO, is not, uh, doesn't have the mandate for, for, for Europe, uh, for the EU. Uh, I know it sounds lame, but that's, that's the case. And so whatever funding is channeled to Poland, it goes to the government. And then um, there is effectively almost no, no channel for the time being, any sizable channel of, of directing government funds, be it European or, or state, uh, from the Polish government to the NGOs. There are some initiatives, there are some calls for proposals in the range of a few million zlotys, which is, which, is, uh, which is significant for small NGOs, but does not provide good, uh, good response. But, um, you know, if you had seen the Polish uh, politicians speaking um, back in April or May about there is the Polish military response, they would be saying, oh, this Polish government is doing this, Polish government is doing this, Polish government is doing this, and the Polish government is sending military supplies to Ukraine. Uh, now they, they are starting to realize there is, there is more to that response than only government-driven response, luckily. And they are also starting to realize that in addition to everything what, is, what, what the government is doing, there are certain areas where the government won't be able to provide the assistance and that the assistance is still needed, such as 
care, uh, after school care for children. I mean, small area, but you know, NGOs, come on, have, they have to do it, right? So that realization is creeping there uh, slightly too short, uh, too, 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 uh, too slow. On the, on the assistant teachers, when I, when I heard about the challenges here in the UK, I mean, this could potentially be one of, one, of the, one of the options because the assistant teachers are indeed helping in translation, helping that in curriculum adaptation, mm -hmm. and they are helping in, uh, in a way to, um, to, to, to help children deal with psychological trauma. I mean, and because those Ukrainian refugee, usually refugees, are employed, it gives us also give, give them a sense in life, which is turns out to be very, very important. important. We have done recently an evaluation on that. So, yeah, if you if SAFE or some other organizations feel like implementing this, we'll be happy yeah, to, to show what we know. One of, the, one of the challenges in the UK, and it goes back to the solidarity and, and red tape, is that the um, such tight regulations around um, background checks for anybody who okay, works with we, children. We, we've tackled that. Uh, okay, you can tell us how, because that's still a problem here. Things, right? Yeah, I mean, yeah. It's not just a non state actor that has to adapt, it's mm. also the state. But uh, exactly. It's about campaigning and explaining exactly. exactly. Do, do we comment from the ground? Do, if, do we have any other questions who would like to join? Yeah? I just wanted to say that the amazing response from UK audience, or UK people here, was that not only they offered housing, but in the very first days of the war when I opened the registry, how would you want to help Ukrainians coming to the UK? I've received so many registrations from people saying, I want to help kids. I want to say, uh, help people find jobs. I can work on their CVs. There's so much initiative from the public coming that is not finding the channel. Mm -hmm. There's no coordination center where they can come and offer their help. Councils don't do it. Schools can't do the DBS checks on all people who want to help the kids. There has to be a civil society response. There, there'll be yeah. so many UK volunteers who would want to offer friendly assistance to, in their communities, in air, all the areas of life. When they can't offer housing, they will offer their help in other ways. But there has to be some coordination from uh, NGOs here, yeah. not, not the council, not the schools. Yeah. OK, good point. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. do, do, you want to, do you want to come back? Yeah. Yes, uh, it's probably a Dembski piece. Um, um, what I'm hearing is that uh, both for governments, uh, British and, Pol and, and Polish, um, a falling interest uh, on Ukraine is, is a source of, of concern. It's about, it's, it, I'm hearing here in this panel that it is also the source of concern for humanitarian organizations for different reasons, for different reasons. But it looks like there is a, a, a area of common interest. Um, the government likes to keep unity of, of, uh, of the free world, to keep uh, arming Ukraine, to keep uh, uh, helping Ukraine to win the war, while humanitarian organizations want to keep this interest high to uh, you know, raise money and be able to help, uh, uh, help people on the ground. So is it you know, any chance, is it in any way to combine these two interests and uh, create a kind of the cooperation um, addressing this particular concern. So is it possible to create joint action of humanitarian organization and both governments to help convince the general public uh, of the world um, to keep you know, this interest still um, uh, in motion? Yeah, well, it's, it's an interesting question indeed about this also trilateral, like the triangle between Ukraine, Poland, UK, and what could go under beneath the, the infrastructure of this cooperation. Could there be some UK, Ukraine? Yes, NGO, council, humanitarian system, something more sustainable. I don't know what you think. Me? Yes. Um, the, and then uh, we'll go to the, I, think, I think there are, there are ways to combine interests, but uh, we have to turn it from the zero-sum game into something more of a positive sum game. Because especially here in the UK, you have seen a lot of, a lot of organizations saying, well, all the money is being diverted towards Ukraine. What about Yemen? What about Somalia? What about South Sudan? And there are emergencies, right? I think that not only the UK, 
Poland, other donors, if they could find a, an ability to retain the engagement and assistance to the countries that have not been better in the last few months or years, while and at, above that provide assistance to Ukraine, mm -hmm. I think this would this would address those concerns because right now there is a bit of a competition, right? U Ukraine here, well, what about the other uh, challenges, including the food crisis? Mm -hmm. uh, so, and, and I personally believe, uh, I, may, I may be whacked for that, but I personally believe that the food crisis is slightly ramped up because some of the organizations who are normally engaged in sub-Saharan Africa or the other hunger-affected areas of the world, they're ramping it up in a way to, to, to get the funding for their operations there and tension, we need to change it from the zero into the positive sum game. Uh, secondly, um, I think here we can also bring a consensus by building an understanding that effectively the post-1945, post-1990 world order has, uh, it's either collapsed completely or it's in a very big and grave threat. And, and this is where this is where we need to look into a big, um, you know, a bigger picture, and that this this conflict, okay, it's 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 in Ukraine, it's and it's but it's but it's affecting uh, the the world moreover, um, and uh, and um, there is I think that go the, the Japanese ambassador to Poland is, he said that this that the, that the war in Ukraine is a threat to the global uh, rules based world order or something like this. Uh, some, and, like, I'm, I'm less of the diplomatic lingo, but, but if the, I think we can reach an agreement at, and, and, and devise a joint advocacy points where the uh, think tankers, where the governments, where some of the NGOs, we could play along. But we have, this has to be a, a, a positive sum game. Mm -hmm. yeah. Because in the end, we will be better off if, you know, in a way, there is a, proper resolution to this other than the gray zone and they will have to bear with the pressure of flows of people and insecurity for a very long time. It's also an important how, what is the end game out of this and what kind of game we'll see. So, so Paula, what do you think? Um, I think it's possible to do, to do both. Um, we do have a different opinion on the food crisis. I think just looking at the data, um, it's going to be horrific. Um, but that doesn't mean we have to take from one place to give to somewhere else. It's, it's an and, and. And I think if I look at the UK and how much public support there was uh, and still is for Ukraine and also the money that has been raised, I think DEC usually offers a three-year funding window. I think it's extended this one to five because there's so much. So it's giving that kind of continuity. Um, and so the BBC and the government and everybody else will want to demonstrate that. I mean, the BBC were in Warsaw last week filming Ukrainian house which has set up a school for, for Ukrainian kids. So I think there will be um, a lot of kind of positive stories coming out uh, of showing. Uh, I think the, the, from my experience, the Polish government was rightly proud of the work that it's doing as well and needs to demonstrate that back. So I think the kind of positive um, news stories, keeping it in people's minds, I think is very possible to do alongside not forgetting everywhere else. Yeah, kind of enriching communities and also, you know, filling in the, the jobs. I mean, to be honest, it comes a bit in the competition with what the Ukrainian president just said in Chatham House when he was asked, what is the victory for Ukraine? He said, I want all those people to come back. Mm -hmm. and, and perhaps this is another kind of thinking that should be done, what could be done inside Ukraine to ensure that people can come back. It's the whole yeah. issue of recovery. And we'll actually have on the 19th of July an online event here at Chatham House talk, talking about the, how Ukraine sees this recovery um, process. And, and I'll, come back, I'll come to you, Barbara. There's also a specific question to you from online, and I, didn't, I hope the audience, uh, uh, just to bring in a person um, uh, that asked what specifically the Polish government should do to, uh, to the, in the educational process that can relieve NGOs of their obligations. Maybe if you have something to that answer to that. Definitely cooperate. The to thing is, cooperate. cooperate with you because, uh, well, it, it doesn't have to be added like for Ukraine. You. It just has to be the fact that we very often are in contact with local authorities. And just like, yes, we have one place where we have classes. Okay, but what is the scale? 
you have, for instance, for one season, because let's be realist, like it's not one Ukrainian kid, one teacher. It cannot be like this. It's usually a group which starts at some point and then after three weeks, another kid cannot join just simply. It's much more convoluted than that. So uh, the problem with local authorities is very often that either they don't have the funds or they do not really have the plan mm -hmm. how to really focus on it. So it's not really to alleviate the burden of the NGO's sh shoulders. It's our choice after all, but it's mostly cooperation and how mm -hmm. one can really not only think, is it a good solution for us, is it not? but whether can it improve anything, right? Because again, we can't really constantly think about only a status quo, about, okay, we have 30 kids that we can't really put into any group. Okay, so come on, this NGO or that, uh, let's do classes for this 30 children. There will come more. Yeah. There will be more children. There will be the same children on a different level of Polish, on a different level or any other um, aspect of learning, because that's something that I always think of, is how important it is, for example, for Ukrainian children to be still taught in Ukrainian, to be still taught, for example, Ukrainian language, to give that kind of possibility, even when it's room-wise or just time-wise in certain space, um, since there is, not, there is a question of national identity. There is a question of not assimilating, but integrating. Yeah. It all requires time. It all requires the kind of consciousness of possible, of having to have a space, having to have this kind of also space in mind for certain possible solutions mm -hmm. that may not seem crucial right now, but will be in a very short time space. Um, so definitely the problem with authorities is how it's very difficult to communicate. And I think that's how I wanted to come back to the question that was before uh, from the public. Um, it's very easy to think, okay, let's communicate all the actors, but who are the actors? Okay, I want to contact the government as an NGO. Who is the government? I'm going to send an email to our prime minister. He's not going to reply, let me tell you. Uh, I'm going to, and, and that's just a thing. Even and my especially if you have new organizations yes. like yours oh. coming on the block, right? Yes, you, yes, you have yes. old timers who have the connections and they know the people, yes, so it's yes, much yes. easier for them. I yeah. think even um, uh, our. So now you know Wojtek. I'm sure yeah. he can help you. Yeah, but no, <laughs> even even our founder was uh, even our founder. We were really much communicating with Save the Children. We've yeah. talked a lot. We had very a lot of discussions with both our. Estonian NGOs, it just takes time. Yeah. And again, find the actors, find the appropriate contacts, it just takes time. It takes even the horrible word networking. Oh, um, word. Quite horrible. <laughs> it's an amazing word. We hope we give you opportunity to network here. This is what partially think, what Chatham House especially does. Especially in my generation is a yeah. bit overused okay. and I think that's the stigma okay. that I have towards it. Well, I, I think, I'm, I'm sorry, but we'll have to wrap up this session and, you know, clearly we, we've touched on some points where there's a desire to improve things, there's a desire to remain committed, there's, the, there's um, understanding of the, the scale of this, uh, tragedy and uh, both on a human level and governmental level, business level, civil society level, there's desire to be engaged because this is how we survive tragedy, by actually being engaged. This would help us to remain sanity and to, to believe in humanity, you know, to be honest. And I think it's so important, the work that you do. So I want to thank you, first of all, for the work that you do uh, that is uh, really exhausting, demanding, I'm sure. So, you know, it really you are the hero, so we'd like to give a round of applause to people who are doing it, um, touching the hearts of thousands of people and uh, thank them for um, their uh, contribution and all of you for asking the questions. And if, you, if we provoke some kind of solutions or thinking uh, with this discussion, do come over and, and talk to us. Wojtek, you want to say something at the end? I wanted to end on a positive note. Please. Uh, you know, those people who came to Poland, those people who came to UK, will see uh, how our societies work. Most of them have never been out of Ukraine before. And when, so when they will bring, come back to Ukraine after the war, they will bring, I hope, the best practices from the UK, the best practices from, from Poland and other countries back to Ukraine. And perhaps this will be a massive push to, Euro to European integration of Ukraine 
done on a people-to-people -people level. Yeah, very good, very good point. And uh, um, the organizers asked you to stay here because there will be right next session, so you can stretch your legs, but just don't go too far away, because they will come back from two other uh, rooms, breakaway rooms, for a concluding session. Thank you so much for joining our discussion, and enjoying the rest of the session.